Actually, before uh, I begin a word about life, I have to give a word about the word about life. It's a statement about a white church using the blues. And this is my personal view, and it comes out of my journey as a racist in recovery and the discovery of the white privilege culture that I'm a part of and I benefit from. I individualize this statement because not all of us are at the same place, and I make the statement because I'm trying to have integrity. We have no business incorporating blues music into our worship service without being aware of the ways it is a cultural appropriation. What is cultural appropriation? The Oxford Dictionary defines cultural appropriation as the acknowledged or inappropriate adoption of the customs, practices, ideas, etc. of one people or society by members of another and typically more dominant people or society. Simply put, it is when someone adopts something from a culture that is not their own, a hairstyle, a piece of clothing, a manner of speaking, a type of exercise, yoga for example, or music, blues for example. But the adoption of something from a culture not your own is only part of the story. Cultural exchange is a good thing. And cultural exchange happens between people of equal power and there is a mutual agreement and a mutual interchange. Cultural appropriation, however, refers to a particular power dynamic in which members of a dominant culture take elements from a culture of people who have been systematically oppressed by that dominant group. For example, our use of blues music. Blues music is undeniably black a crucial cultural expression rooted in black social history. That doesn't mean that the blues are closed to white people, either to listen to, to dance to, or to play. What it does mean, however, is that white people need to listen to what the blues tell us about our own history and the ways in which our group may have been involved in the oppression of previous generations. Clearly, this is not just something that is relevant to white Americans. Many of us live in regions where the repercussions of previous years' discrimination or oppression are still felt today. The blues should alert us to injustices in our own history. By telling the truth about what went on, the blues highlight the need to understand our own present in the light of the past and to ensure that every vestige of discrimination is rooted out. Blues music is black music and we are allowed to listen in, appreciate it, and learn from it. Blues music is uniquely and historically grounded in the black experience of what it means to be a black person in the United States. James Cone, professor of theology at Union Seminary in New York, said the blues is the artistic response to the chaos of life. Blues music is also a specific expression of what it means universally for human beings to find life, love, and celebrate life in the midst of chaos. And so we listen to what the blues tell us about our history and our culture. But I also want us to listen to what the blues tell us about having a comprehensive view of life. Now this would be a good place to end the sermon, but I won't. I want to cover one more thing as we think about a piece in our covenant, our statement of faith as Shadow Rock. It says, our task together demands a comprehensive view of life, always pointed intentionally to the future. 
This was the part of the covenant that informed a sermon I gave several years ago. I'm sure you remember. I shared a story from our faith to complement this piece of the covenant. It comes from Ezra. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Aspeth, with cymbals, according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to God. For God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised God. Because the foundation, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the family, old people who had seen the first house of the foundation, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house. Though many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. Because they compared the old foundation, which was much larger, with the new foundation, which was much smaller. And some people were overcome with grief of what had been lost. And some people shouted with joy as to what would happen next. But they could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. Several years ago, I shared this story from which the dubious quote, some will be glad and some will be sad, emerged. In fact, to prove the point of the quote, the quote itself evoked the response that some will be glad about the quote and some will be sad about the quote. <laughs> the little saying was never intended to be a weapon to use against people who did not like a decision or who were sad. It never was to be interpreted as a petulant child saying to the losers, nana nana boo boo. It never occurred to me it could be interpreted this way until it was pointed out to me. The intent is captured more by the tone and the words of this too shall pass, whether it's good or bad, rather than suck it up, buttercup. I think our heads and our hearts are in this place. Some will be glad and some will be sad. Are in this place on this Sunday after an election. Some will be glad and some will be sad. In fact, many people probably feel sad and glad at the same time. My intention of sharing the story from our wisdom tradition and the quote was to affirm a piece of wisdom from our own covenant. That is, our task together demands a comprehensive view of life, always pointed for the future. I think a comprehensive view of life means an acknowledgement that life is full of push and pulls and terrors and joys. A comprehensive view of life includes living in the knowledge that we are finite beings going to die, and yet our imagination can push us to contemplate the infinite. A comprehensive view of life means we need solitude and individuality and self-identity, and at the same time we desire community and belonging. A comprehensive view of life means that we want our joys and pleasures to be eternal, but they often are not. A comprehensive view of life means we do not live in denial of our death and at the same time we can celebrate our life and the lives of others. A comprehensive view of life means that we accept that our life emerges out of the larger context of being itself and being itself will go on long after we turn to dust. A comprehensive view of life means that all of us will be glad sometimes and sad other times. 
A comprehensive view of life means we not only accept this reality for ourselves, but we accept its truth for everyone else. And we care. Let's make it less philosophical and more concrete. A comprehensive view of life means that the same family reunion around turkey and dressing is an observance of joy and gratitude and at the same time a source of anxiety. A comprehensive view of life means that the police that rush into a building to protect lives against a shooter are the same police that can shoot a black man in the back. The soldiers that kill because they are only following orders are the same soldiers that build hospitals and schools. The church that feeds the hungry and gives shelter to the stranger is the same church that abuses power and preys on the most vulnerable. The nightclub that was a place of dancing and celebrating life turns into a death trap and eventually will be a place of dancing and hope again. A comprehensive view of life demands that we hold the mixed bag of institutions, elections, life itself with both hands and straight on. This means we celebrate life and grieve another mass shooting at the same time without flinching. And so I bring us back to the blues. I quote Gary W. Burnett out of his book, The Gospel According to the Blues. The blues, to be sure, was entertainment. But the blues has always expressed something deep about human life. It includes the whole gamut of human experience, deep sorrow and lament, lament rage, resentment, murder, right through to joy, hope, and victory. The blues has always had the power to touch people deeply, and they are music that seems to resonate at the deepest levels of our souls. This earthy, gritty nature of the blues is not something for Christians to shy away from. Rather, it is all the more reason to want to engage deeply with the blues. For in the blues, we come face to face with real human life, struggle, discrimination, imprisonment, violence, and poverty, with rambling, no good, drunken men, with unfaithful women. These are all the subject of the blues. All human life is here. It seems to me, then, that the blues might very well be a very interesting and indeed appropriate place from which to consider the gospel of Jesus Christ, a gospel that itself has much to say about failed human beings, suffering, sorrow, justice, joy, and hope. Please pray with me. And so we come together to lift up not just part of our lives, not just the sorrow or the joy, but all of it. We come together in wonder of how strong we are and how frail we are at the same time. We come together in wonder at the blessings and the graces of the past, the uncertainty of the future, our trust that love will have the last word. We come together praying for all people, black, white, red, yellow, all their unique histories, the depth of their experience of what it means to be human, 
and to learn from each other. And we come together mindful of people doing the best they can and yet life unfolds. So we pray for Jody and Darren. Darren, who tried to take his life this past week, feeling the burden, the weight of so many lives. We pray for people who are grieving, who are mourning. I thank you for their strength to stay by the bedside of their loved ones and to hold them and to watch them slip into eternity. We pray for the families that are suffering losses, thinking that their children will go out, have a good time, and come back. And yet they don't come back. We pray for wisdom and strength and the political will to do the most life-giving and most loving thing for people. We pray for our veterans that they especially, but yet for all people, that they would feel honored, that they would feel understood, that they would be healed, that they would know the rewards of respect for faithful service, that they would know God and be known by God. This is our prayer for them, for all of us, and for all we carry in our heart. For this is the task before us, the task together demands a comprehensive view of life. Hear our prayer. May all the people say, Amen.